Yeah, cheers. All right. Uh, welcome to the last session of the UC Santa Cruz Open Source Symposium. Uh, this is a panel on computational storage. Um, and uh, it's a, uh, you know, a, a, a round table for all kinds of challenges that we um, working on here at UC Santa Cruz um, related to computational storage. Um, computational storage is uh, the general area of embedding computation into the storage layer. Uh, and it has the promise of significantly reducing uh, resource utilization of data intensive applications, especially distributed applications, uh, anywhere from, uh, you know, within a single machine to uh, across mon multiple data centers or even regions of data centers. Uh, transmission of data costs, it's costs in terms of latency, as well as resources, power, um, and, and also processing cycles, right? So whatever data you sent, you need to also receive. And those are um, cycles that you need to use to copy the data from the network into your application address space. So um, APIs like S3 Select uh, are, are showing that there's significant interest and also uh, a need for uh, having data services that allow you to select data based on attributes um, and all kinds of filtering operations, right? But furthermore, it's not only the storage layer, it's also when applications communicate with each other. Um, so we have uh, a, a significant um, you know, need to offload processing of data from machines that do for instance simulations or machine learning uh, and 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 look at ways to move the data processing pipeline off those machines so that the expensive CPUs can be used for um, things that that have value and and uh, devices at a lower cost point can take over doing some of these data processing tasks and in particular smart NICs have been, uh, emerging as a, a, as a promising solution. Um, and we will hear about that as well. Um, in general, this session will explore on this panel, we'll explore some of the challenges and opportunities for embedding data processing and storage. Um, and we will cover a, a, a number of different aspects. So speakers today, uh, Esmael Mirvakili, he is a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz. Um, uh, and he's uh, talking. going to talk about managing buffer bloat in storage systems. Uh, it's essentially enabling storage systems that have sort of this typical architecture of a front end and a back end um, to actually schedule uh, various workloads. And that becomes, of course, more important as we embed computation into storage, because now we have more tasks to uh, juggle, right? Or the storage system has to... Um, and the storage layer in general has uh, to juggle more tasks. So it's important that we get the right balance, um, hit the right priorities. Um, and so that is traditionally not something that storage systems have been designed to do. Second talk is uh, Jinxin Liu, also from UCSC, graduate student, um, who is going to present um, a recent presentation he gave at HPEC, um, High Performance uh embedded computing um and he won for that presentation and for the paper uh, he submitted an outstanding student paper award very interesting work on processing particle data flows uh with smart uh and i think i uh, hope that we're also going to have some people from the um uh from the apache error community participating in the session because um He's using Apache Arrow uh, libraries for doing that. And uh, independently, on a recent data thread conference that Voltron Data gave, um, some of the people, actually, in fact, Ian Cook, uh, sort of put out a vision that he was really hoping for a world where Apache Arrow and uh, Substrate, which is another part of, would be embedded in SmartNex. So <laughs> I was in this very nice position to tell him what we're working on. So um, 
Then uh, Jajit Chakraborty, he um, is going to work on, I mean, he's going to uh, present on Skyhook, uh, our error native storage system based on Ceph. He's a graduate student also at UC UCSD. Um, and then we're going to hear from Aldrin Montana, um, graduate student at UCSC. So you get a pattern here um, on computational storage in the Human Cell Atlas project. And we have also his advisor, Peter Alvaro. Thank you for, for joining. And, um, and then also uh, uh, one of the students of Peter Alvaro, Holly Casaletto. Uh, she is going to present on age sensitive physical design management for a data lake house architecture. So uh, interesting program. I asked the panelists to give a 10 minute presentation, about 10 pre minute presentation, and then we can open things for, up for discussion. Uh, everyone is of course also free to ask questions during those presentations. We wanna you know, have this session as interactive as possible. Um, so maybe I give the floor to Esmael, if he's here. Um, Esmael, are you here? Yeah, should be. Uh, yeah, Carlos, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, so my project is about managing buffer bloat in a storage system and ultimately design a scheduling algorithm on the storage systems to uh, make sure that uh, basically the uh, it can uh, basically meet the quality of service requirements. Uh, so first, let me talk about the uh, storage systems and scheduling the storage systems. Uh, when we talk about this uh, distributed storage system, uh, the most of the distributed storage system can be simplified and abstract uh, to this architecture. Basically, a client uh, have some, uh, needs to uh, manipulate some of data. It's uh, get authorized and metadata from the file management, and then have access to a storage servers. And this, uh, the storage of this uh, data can be uh, different types, like object, key value, files, block. So there are many type of the storage. Uh, uh, when you look at the storage servers. Uh, this storage servers tends to be uh, designed in two different parts, a front end and a back end. Uh, the reason is that the uh, there are many uh, type of storage devices out there like a, a hard drive or SSD or any VME. And we need, uh, 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 basically the storage server can uh, needs to uh, have a different program to basically uh, treat them differently. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we want to have a basically high level uh, implementation of the storage system. For example, if the storage system like Ceph is based on the objects, uh, they have a higher level implementation of objects. So if we want to keep that apart from the de uh, details of the storage device itself. So uh, the storage server are usually um, uh, created in two parts, front end and back end. Front end is the uh, basically responsible for higher level of the data and request, and the back end is responsible for uh, up, um, basically I/O operation on the device uh, itself. And this back end can be replaced by different type of back ends. For example, it can be replaced by a, um, for example, a RaxDB um, uh, database, or it can be replaced with a uh, NVMe device or any kind of backends here. So they basically keep the higher level uh, operation and uh, basically the logic on the front end untouched. Uh, but the problem is that uh, most of this uh, system in the backend have the very large or unbounded queue because they love to uh, have a lot of requests on the backend, so the backend can utilize the device uh, fully and maximize the throughput. Uh, but the problem uh, that happens is that uh, the front end, on the other hand, uh, needs enough number of requests to uh, make a, a sound decision how to schedule the requests. For example, if we have multiple low-level requests and we uh, send all of them to the backend and 
suddenly a high level a high uh, priority request arrives we won't be able to schedule that ahead of those uh, basically uh, requests and on the back end uh, the scheduling is based on the ios uh, so it, the back end need, wants to schedule ios so that uh, they are basically running on the uh, storage device efficiently. For example, if uh, the device, the storage device is a hard um, HDD, so it wants to uh, order the IOs, so they are mostly sequentially, so they don't have to do a seek time too, uh, too many times and optimize the uh, basically the latencies. Uh, but uh, now the problem would be uh, how much requests should be sent to the backend and how much we should keep in the front end. So the front end can be able to schedule these requests, high level requests more efficiently and basically realize the uh, quality of service requirement. And also we want to have enough a number of requests in the backend so we can have a, a acceptable throughput. So our question was uh, this, and the, basically the solution uh, that easily comes to mind is just having an admission control or a back pressure on the back end, in the middle of front end and back end. Uh, the goal of this uh, admission control is that uh, we need to submit enough number of requests to the back end so we can keep the acceptable, acceptable throughputs of the system. But we should uh, also, we shouldn't put uh, basically send too much uh, requests to the backend and keep some of them in the front end to be able to do the scheduling and realize the quality of service uh, requirement. Also, this should uh, adapt to the different dynamic workloads. So uh, the system needs uh, to run without any parameters and uh, dynamically and adapt to the workload changes. Uh, so what we did was that uh, uh, the same problem uh, exists in network uh, basically area that uh, it's called buffer bloat. Uh, basically, sometimes the routers or the servers uh, buffer too much data to a downstream. So it, they're going to be some uh, desirable, undesirable latencies, latency spikes, and uh, a lot of performance issues. Uh, the solution for that in the network, uh, one of them was the Cuddle algorithm. It's a well-known algorithm that basically tries to control the flow of data by initiating packet loss if the queuing delay rises than a target latency than a certain parameters. Uh, we implemented the similar approach for Ceph storage in the basically uh, in the backend. So in the way that uh, the, um, we monitor the latency of the backend and try to adjust and control the, the flow of data using a throttle, uh, we, set, uh, we set a budget or a batch size, and we basically adjust it based on the data, uh, based on the latency of the backend, similar to Cuddle algorithm. Uh, but the problem was that this uh, design doesn't really uh, account for the dynamic workloads. As the workload changes, uh, we need to adjust the target latency and the parameters on the Cuddle algorithm to be able to uh, basically achieve a, a reasonable and acceptable throughput. Uh, but the uh, Cuddle algorithm that we have here doesn't really, is not really adaptive enough to basically account for multiple dynamic uh, and uh, unpredictable workloads. Uh, so we went to design uh, the uh, a more adaptive version of this model. So basically, we use a dual loop control uh, that basically controls the parameters and the model itself. So it instead of the basically latency, on the other hand, the uh, and there is another loop that controls this uh, model algorithm based on the throughputs. So what it does is basically is uh, tr doing trade-off between latency and the throughput. Uh, on the left side, you can see a, a typical uh, uh, relation of the throughput and the latency on such designs. Uh, you can see after uh, basically having enough number of requests on the backend, the throughput doesn't increase after a certain time, but 
latency will increase because the most of the requests are waiting the queues and most of this latency is, is a queuing time instead of the uh, basically the execution of these uh, IOs. So what we did was that uh, we uh, measure and uh, observe this throughput in, in order to the latency and we try to have a trade-off between the latency and throughput based on a certain parameters, a, a constant parameter, which is not dependent to the workload. Uh, this so this algorithm basically do, does that and control the parameters of the regular CADA algorithm to adapt to the uh, different workloads. Uh, here we have some result from uh, the implementation of this CADA algorithm in Ceph. Uh, so uh, in this uh, graphs, you can see different, different number of parameters for controlling this algorithm that how much trade-off between the latency and the throughput should happen here. And uh, the, the top row uh, uh, graphs are related to the throughput and the bottom ones are the latencies. And we did that to multiple, uh, basically, uh, workloads, four kilobyte writes and 64 kilobyte writes. And as you can see, it will, we could easily control the, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the relation between the uh, latency and the throughput by increasing the, uh, by uh, closing the knob and increasing the target slope, we could control and re reduce the latency. And by, on the other hand, the throughput would uh, decrease as well. Uh, so what we did, uh, what we need is that basically study these uh, changes on the system and uh, decide on a certain parameters. This parameter target slope is uh, basically, it's not dependent to the workload. So it's defining the, uh, how much, uh, much trade-off do you want to have between the latency and the throughput. So for example, one means that uh, we are willing to lose one uh, unit of throughput in order to have a better, uh, uh, better uh, latencies, uh, one unit of uh, improvement in the latencies. So by defining this parameter, the uh, admission control can control the latencies and the number of the requests is submitting to the backend. And basically in the future works, we, we are planning to use this uh, feature that uh, this uh, admission control brings some uh, predictable latency to the backend. So we have more predictable backend. We can use this uh, information and uh, keep a uh, history of the latency from backend and predict the execution time of these requests much better in the scheduler. So the scheduler is able to uh, make more wise their uh, decisions about the request the scheduling and ordering this, uh, the request to realize either uh, throughput uh, SLAs or deadline and latency uh, objectives in the for quality of service. Uh, any questions? So I think we have a, a question in, um, oh, in the yeah, chat. No, in, in, not in the chat, but in the in Google Doc. So Aldrin, do you want to? Yeah, I can. <clears throat> I was a. Uh... Fortunately, writing in a doc, let me think it through. So what I want to say is like uh, in networks, like you're pretty likely to have multiple routers in a hop and how many routers in, uh, you may hop between can be very different between different paths. So I pr presumably like this algorithm just kind of works or is good enough, um, you know, even though it's probably only looking locally within the router. So my question kind of is, like when you're trying to do this with storage systems like in Ceph, like is that tolerance or sensitivity to latency fairly similar? Uh, and then like, how does that change? Like if we're looking to storage systems where like a storage server might actually, you, your, your storage request might have multiple hops, right? Like maybe you have computational devices or maybe your storage server is even doing like a remote read or write, you know, like I'm just curious, like if that's being, considered already or like you know what are your thoughts on that yeah so 
I didn't really include the details here, but uh, the way that Coddle works, does it have a target latency and monitor the queuing delay? Uh, we find out that basically, the, like measuring this queuing delay similar to the network is not really fit for the storage system. So the basically, so for, for example, in the network, they have a certain, uh, uh, basic parameter that it works for every networks because the workload is almost the same. But in the storage server, it's not the case. So we uh, we went away. Uh, we went for a change in the coddle and we changed it a little bit. One was that basically we measured the whole latency instead of queuing delay, and we tried to uh, basically control the the total latency in the backend based on the certain targets. But this target should be designed uh, for the certain workload itself. Like uh, we want to keep the latency lower than five milliseconds, but this might not work for the other workloads, for example, 64 kilobytes. It might work for four, four kilobyte workloads, but for 64 kilobyte, it might uh, decrease the throughput too much. That is not acceptable. So that was why we, uh, on the other part, uh, we design another loop, uh, another loop to control this uh, target latency using money by monitoring the throughput itself to adapt that late uh, target latency to the need and the uh, in incoming uh, workload. So can we also really quickly interject because I think there's also a little bit um, clarification necessary. So the computation that we're thinking about, right, embedding the computation and storage layer would only happen on the front end, not in the back end. So in that sense, it's not the front end, I mean, the back end is not affected by any computation, right? The key is though, that you wanna prioritize between the front end and the back end uh, or, or tasks, you know, and you can only do that in the front end. So once you submit something to the back end, it just sits in the queue. And no matter how important something sits there in the front end, you know, it might not get into the back end because it's already and, full. And I would just add to that, Carlos. Aldrin, one of your questions was about sort of remote reads and writes and arbitrary multi-hop versions of this, right? I imagine that for all but the last hop, they don't traverse the back end at all. It would be front ends. And so to, to address that problem, doing something like random early detection for a multi-hop remote read, you would have to implement some kind of back pressure on the front end queue, which is out of scope, I think, for this presentation. But it's, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Cool. <clears throat> um, I had a quick question for, for Esmael, if that's mm -hmm. OK. Um, and I, maybe this is just uh, graphs you haven't shown, but I, th I thought like the latency uh, uh, throughput trade-offs are fascinating to, to, to look at. But the problem statement that you started with involved two things, uh, uh, quality of service for high priority requests that might not get serviced in time or by their deadline or something like that. And then the other thing was about variability in latency. And I didn't see anything in any of the evaluations that addressed either of those. Do you have any measurements planned to say, this is how bad it could be, for example, how badly a high priority request could starve uh, without the admission control. I'm just curious, like how you're thinking about evaluating those two parts of the problem statement. Uh, yeah, so evaluating the, if this basically is really helpful to the scheduling or not, is really hard to evaluate, but we are working on implementing a new scheduling algorithm to use the basically the the backend itself so we are planning to have like some a measurement to somehow to uh, measure the impact of this um, back pressure on the scheduling as well uh, for example some uh, for example to measure the number of the violation of the deadline maybe yeah or, yeah. yeah okay Great. But as it is, we don't have the scheduling part yet uh, done yet completely. So I didn't have any result for that. So I think it's a great talk. I think the talk would be better if there was also a graph showing me like how much better the variability and latency is compared to the baseline. And that's something you should be able to do. I agree that the priority is going to be harder. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Any more questions? before we can go to the next presentation. And we will have more, you know, much more time for discussions afterwards. Um, we look at the bigger picture. Um, okay. 
Thank you, Ismail. Plop, plop, plop. <laughs> it's a... Uh, uh, then Thank let's go, uh, let's go to the next speaker, Jinchen Liu. Uh, do you want to share your slides? And uh... sure. Thank you, colleagues. Um, so I'm happy to talk about my recent paper about the processing particle, da particle data flows with Smonix. Uh, I'm Jen Shen, and this is joint work with my advisor, Carlos, and colleagues from Sindir Natural Labs, Matthew Curry, and Craig Elmer. So in this talk, um, what I mean by particle data is that the state information of different kinds of objects, such as the position and velocity information. As, as you can see on the uh, right-hand corner, of this slide on the top, it shows the uh, spatially organized form of the airplane position data, and followed by it, the uh, temporally organized form of the same data. The temporal form of the data is important because it can help you to get better insight of the, uh, into the uh, patterns of activity of these objects than the other form can provide. Start with this, I would like to continue to talk about some of the background about data management in scientific workflows. Many distributed systems uh, often requires to route parallel streams of data between a large number of producers and consumers. And producers produce massive output usually. So for example, uh, in scientific computer simulations, they uh, generate particle data sets and in geographic information systems, they uh, need to aggregate uh, audible data flows from a variety of sensors. So from the point of view of the producers, they want efficient export and distribution of the data with the minimal overhead. Well, on the, on the other hand, from, uh, for the consumer side, they most of the time they want to customize the retrieval because they just want to get selected portion of the output. And so they uh, want to get the data as soon as possible. So because of this drastic different uh, expectation or view on the source of the data, just like what I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, um, that about the airplane position data that has two different forms. It requires that the, the source data need to be transformed to be of value to downstream consumers. Traditionally, this transformation task uh, is done by the host, but that would create a uh, disturbance to host applications. And therefore we are thinking uh, to see whether there is a better way to handle these transformation tasks by shifting the transformation work from the host to the network and such that we can uh, reduce the interference to host applications. The Smonic uh, is a great, provides us a great opportunity to uh, handling the transformation tasks for intrinsic data. Uh, the Bluefield, uh, NVIDIA Bluefield 2 is, um, is the Smonic we are tested and evaluated on, and it's also one of the uh, popular Smonic on the market right now. It has uh, eight ARM processor cores with 16 gigabytes of DRAM and also comes with a couple of accelerators, including an impression and encryption accelerator. It also has two 100 gigabit network uh, cores. For computing resources, uh, this is money, uh, obviously has much less computing resources than those available to a host, but we still believe they are uh, sufficient for handling low compute density and asynchronous tasks, such as uh, to transform the data and store the data and split the data, things like that. Uh, this is money can run a modern Linux operating system within it, and so uh, this is a a great help because we can just run uh, the data services uh, to web and run the data services uh, within the Smonic using the API provided by standard libraries. The isolated compute environment is also a plus provided by Smonic because uh, by running the data services inside the Smonic, in the ARM envir environment of the Smonic, we can just have minimum overhead or interference to um, the host applications. So we use the Apache Arrow um, to organize the particle data flows in memory because this library provides a rich set of uh, API uh, that is specific designed for uh, data analytics tasks and also the, they meet the majority of what we need uh, for processing the particle data. So for example, the API provided by this library is uh, the serialization API and so um, we can use, the, use this function to convert the data from the in-memory format to the on-the-wire format. 
And also it has uh, different APIs for partition and projection and aggregated data. Uh, it also, uh, for compression, it has a compression support uh, built into the APIs. Uh, the data compression is important with, as we think because uh, it can help to uh, factory reduce the size of the data that need to be transferred over the network. Uh, the log structure registry or the LS entry is a technique for reorganizing streaming data. Uh, but it, it, this technique is, is also very helpful um, for distributed uh, the, the uh, particle data flow processing onto a collection of smartics with each of the smartic as a single processing element in the tree. Uh, the figure on the right shows uh, essentially shows how a smartic received the data from the host and use its local resources to a partition and distribute the data onto the smartic at the next level in the tree. So essentially overall the, 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 the key idea of this work is that we would like to use the smartic to offload the task of transforming the data. But at the same time, we would like to use uh, the patch arrow to describe and manipulate and be able to run uh, queries on the intrinsic data. And so with this software and hardware available and you need to think about a performance issue and specifically we'd like to measure uh, where's the time spent um, during the partitioning when using the Bluefield 2 as Monic. Um, so in this evaluation, we uh, use a simple algorithm uh, by first unpacking the particle data objects, uh, meaning to convert the, the object from the, on the wire format to the in-memory format. And then, uh, uh, try to split the data uh, into two to 16 objects based on the part of ID. And then eventually uh, <clears throat> repack the objects uh, back to the on the wire format and such that we can continue to ship the data to the semantic at the, at the next level uh, of the process. We measured the amount of time uh, for each of the operation phases uh, by running the program on the semantic on, on the proof to semantic to process one gigabyte of data from uh, each of the three particle data set coming from the three domains. And so the figure below shows uh, essentially the time breakdown for uh, each of the operation phases uh, while worked with the planes data set. Uh, under the, the compression, uh, the different compressions that are currently supported by Apache Arrow. So by looking at uh, the, the unpacking and repacking uh, area highlighted by the red marks uh, in, in this figure. Uh, we see that uh, when, when the compression, uh, when, when the partition without involving the compression uh, at the first phase, but uh, as long as involving the compression uh, in, into, the, into this process, we can see it, it just involves significant overhead. And so we see that the handling compression software is a significant impediment. And as I mentioned previously, the Bluefield 2 has a compression accelerator um, that we may leverage to reduce the compression overhead. And so this compression is, uh, the accelerator is uh, performant, but uh, currently it is difficult to use because uh, of the packet processing EDI introduced by DBDK. So we implement or developed our own library called Bitar that helps to make the compression accelerator easy to use. This library features uh, a, zero, a couple of features, including the zero copy, asynchronous and synchronous API to ensure performance efficiency. But you can also use it to assign the, uh, the compression tasks on the multiple SMONIX using multiple cores available on the system. The program that uses beta can, all, can run either on the host or on the Bluefield 2 card as illustrated by the figure on the right. And so for example, if you have a serialization program that uses beta to handle the compression, you can run the program on the host as shown in the left figure. And you can also run the program inside the smart, on, inside the ARM environment of the smartic, just like the, the case shown uh, in the right figure. The next slide I'm gonna show the particle data serialization throughput under different compression methods, including the hardware compression uh, using the Bitter library and also a, a software-based compression uh, supported by Apache Arrow. Specifically, it is the the LZ4 compression. So in this uh, slides, uh, um, first of all, for the on-car serialization performance uh, showing in the, the top left of the figure. In a single thread scenarios, uh, the hardware single thread performance outperforms the software single thread performance by 8.6 times. Well, on the 
uh, multi-threaded case, the Howard two thread performance can also outperform the uh, the the uh, software thirty five thread uh, performance by two point eight times. And you can see the similar uh, performance um, achieved by uh, the on card deserialization as shown in the left the bottom and uh, the bottom left of the figure. So we see that the hardware compression uh, can significantly uh, improve the on card performance with these kind of tasks. And on the right hand side, it shows the uh, essentially the on car on, on host serialization and deserialization performance. For single thread performance, the hardware single thread is still significantly better than the software single thread performance, no matter in the case of uh, serialization or deserialization. But more interestingly is that for the uh, multi-thread cases, the hardware two thread is, is still better than the software 35 thread performance, which is interesting because uh, on the, the for the host we ran the test on has two CPU sockets uh, with a total of 64 CPU cores. And so with this uh, amount of CPU cores, they are enough to drive the this threads, uh, 35 threads in parallel. That means that the, the hardware compression uh, in this case can beat the software-based compression uh, even though the software compression uses all the CPU cores available on a CPU socket. So let me summarize uh, what I talk about in this presentation, in this short presentation. Uh, so first, this Smiley provides a great opportunity to transform the intrinsic data with uh, minimal uh, interference to host applications. The hardware accelerators uh, are essential for performing tasks that need to work at the next network speed. And we presented the beta library that we developed to simplify the use of uh, compression accelerator that is available from our Groovy 2 Smonic. The Apache Arrow is, uh, is extremely useful for, for helping to process the particle data as it provides a rich set of ABI specific design for data analytics tasks. It also has uh, excellent community support to ensure it continually integrate new features and big bugs. And I think this um, concludes what I talk um, in this presentation. Thank you very much. I would like to Take questions. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? So I have a, if nobody has a question, I have a question. Um, yeah, I think uh, actually the question from uh, Peter is, is there a write up you can share? Um, and I think, yeah, you know, maybe you can post that on the, on the Google doc. Uh, like a link to the paper uh, or I can actually do one because I have a link actually <laughs> so let me just do that but I want to ask a question really quickly um, when you talk about the LSM tree um, you know transforming uh, the data do you foresee that how do you foresee a LSM tree maps to a collection of smart necks? So we're thinking like as uh, so the idea is that the, we would like to piggyback the transformation uh, process into the compaction task in the as entry, but it is the distributed form. And so the key thing is that we, uh, in order to uh, uh, shift the processing knowledge or let the other Smarnik uh, know what it's going to do and, uh, and share information with the, its parent Smarnik, for example, we need to have some forms of uh, uh, like execution plan that's supported by Patch Arrow. And so that's just an important part. And so we recently we see the pull request in Patch Arrow that's uh, have the function of uh, uh, using the flight SQL to uh, ship the substrate plan from one node to another node, and so that the the the, the later nodes can know what to do, uh, or know the order of the process. Uh, and so this is is a, a great uh, help to create a chains of process, and and I think it's. Uh, it can with this with this function it can like create a connection and use and fit into the uh, parroting of LS entry. This is a really interesting line of work that I want to see how it proceeds. Really, really nice work. Um, I also want to hear how this idea of 
oversharing details about the query plan, you know, vi which violates layering a little bit, right? But uh, but I, I I I've explored similar ideas. So I think I think it's a really interesting idea. Have you talked to Holly? Because from my perspective, you two are exploring extremely similar hypotheses exactly. via very different mechanisms. True. Okay. So I, we we haven't talked with Holly about the detail about uh, how the how the uh, implementation should look like. But we I see think that in, per in particular, this idea of identifying compaction and leveling uh, as an opportunity to do transformative work, because you have the table stakes of those IOs anyway, is very interesting, right? And 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 you're just exploring it with smart nicks while Holly's exploring it with this remote read and write stuff. It's I think you two should talk. There's rich opportunities to collaborate in my view. <clears throat> Definitely. Yeah, so I, I, and I, that is actually sort of the question right now, right? I, I was sort of, uh, uh, I was more naively kind of asking, you know, how do you map an LSM tree to SmartNICs? But actually the the under the deeper question is, and I, I would love to discuss that. And and maybe um, after we heard all of the talks, you know, um, uh, what what uh, what can we leverage from the, from the uh, Apache Arrow uh, ecosystem? Because uh, there's some really exciting things going on, and and I'm super thrilled that we have Ian Cook who actually also participating, who gave a great talk on on that very issue yesterday. Um, uh, Ian Cook from Baltron Data. So, um, so let me. Um, well, thank you, Jinchen, very much. Um, let me just uh, continue with um, Jajit, who is going to talk about uh, Skyhook, um, and. Uh, and uh, as also a heavy user, user of, of Apache Arrow, <laughs> sort of a common theme here. Um, and uh, uh, Jajit, do you wanna go ahead and share your, your slides? Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh... And thank you, Jinchen, very much. That was a really good talk. And uh, don't forget to post the, or I can do that actually, I said I would do that. Yeah, uh, can you can you all see my screen? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, so hi, hi everyone. So today uh, I will uh, talk about my project on uh, embedding Apache Arrow inside storage systems. So I am a, I'm currently a second year PhD student in the CSA department and I'm advised by Carlos. Uh, okay, so let me start by giving a brief introduction uh, of my project. So. Uh, in general, uh, when we talk about computational storage, we see that uh, most systems uh, are are built uh, with the notion of uh, using like smart hardware, like uh, SSDs embedded with chips, and the actual compute offload part is on a very lower level, which is uh, which is great, which works great, but uh, we uh, we think that. Uh, that amount of complexity is not always required. Uh, maybe we can do something uh, lighter weight and uh, maybe we can just use the CPUs that are in the storage nodes and uh, offload computation to the, to the storage layer basically, instead of going much deeper to the hardware device layer. So we tried to explore that whether uh, that idea works and like uh, what are the challenges that comes with it and how how we perform. So basically, uh, we built Skyhook, uh, which uh, enables compute offloading in existing uh, programmable storage systems. Uh, this is uh, the way it does it that it allows you to embed uh, shared libraries inside directly inside your storage uh, system installation. And thus, uh, it's a very pluggable way of uh, dealing with computational storage. And uh, since we can embed uh, shared libraries, the shared libraries can contain any data access library uh, that, that, that exists out there. So uh, it's, it, it makes the entire ecosystem very modular. People can try out different uh, data access libraries inside different storage systems and see how uh, each, uh, each uh, combination performs. Uh, so yeah, so I will 
discuss the architecture of skyhook which is uh, which is basically an instantiation of what i discussed using apache arrow as the data access library and safe as the uh, distributed storage system uh, so there are two layers basically uh, client and storage so and we basically deal with two paths like read and write so what happens is that uh, safe provides a safe file system posix interface that is just like any other uh, POSIX file system. So users can just uh, write files like CSV, Parquet, uh, or whatever uh, format Apache Arrow supports directly into the POSIX file system layer. And and like in a Hive partition directory or uh, basically any big data data organization form, format that is uh, that Apache Arrow supports. So once the once the files uh, or basically the data set is written to the file system, uh, we need to basically scan those scan the data set. So during scan, we uh, skip the file system layer and uh, rather use the storage uh, access library that uh, that sits uh, one level beneath the file system layer to directly interact with the to directly interact with the files. Or rather, we can say the objects because we are not we are not dealing with the file system anymore. So uh, we use the Apache Arrow Dataset API, which basically provides a dataset abstraction over a bunch of files, and uh, the Dataset API uh, allows querying each file one by one. So when a file is scanned, uh, the file name uh, is basically translated to an object ID uh, using the file system metadata that is present in Ceph. And once we get the object ID, uh, we get to directly invoke a scan of the of the particular object. So that's uh, basically the what what happens on the client side. Now on the server side, uh, the Ceph Ceph basically has a object store layer, which uh, which is composed of a chunk store or a blob store and a key value store for object associated metadata. So uh, uh, at this layer. Uh, so basically, the chunk store contains objects, and uh, we get to embed uh, functions, user-defined functions inside in inside the object storage layer of Ceph, where the function is specifically bounded uh, like to a particular object, like to objects basically. So when we invoke the function call on an object, uh, the functions uh, implement uh, arrow APIs and the object is basically treated as a file inside the storage layer and arrow can directly scan the object and uh, return the uh, like get the resulting arrow tables inside the storage layer and serialize it and return it back to the to the client so uh, that's how it works so uh, we have deployed skyhook uh, till now uh, at two places uh, one is the university of nebraska lincoln and and the ssl cluster at uh, u chicago this is uh, with you know, this is due to our collaboration with uh, the institute of high energy physics ISAP. Uh, i we have upstreamed uh, skyhook into apache arrow project uh, and we have a blog uh, blog uh, in collaboration with uh, Voltron Data, it is linked in the slide. Uh, I will share the slide later. Uh, we also published Skyhook in uh, recently in CC Grid uh, conference. So uh, we found out that while after building Skyhook and measuring the performance, uh, we found out that there were some. Uh, Inefficiency, in, inefficiencies in Skyhook that we need to like uh, fix uh, soon. So the 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 most the so the inefficiency was that uh, arrows memory layout that exists currently it actually need, needs to serialize uh, it it actually needs memory copies to be able to serialize uh, data from a memory format to a wire format. And uh, the, cop the copies that uh, goes into this process it has a very high overhead. So you can see we did a breakdown of the end-to-end -end, uh, lifetime of a request in Skyhook, and we found out that 
like 40 like about 50 percent uh, of the uh, query latency was uh, getting consumed by the serialization overhead from just the memory representation to overhead representation so we tried to uh, we are currently exploring ways to fix that overhead by using zero copy transport protocols uh, using uh, technologies like rdma so uh, this is a collaboration with an organization labs where we use their framework called mochi uh, specifically the thallium framework from the mochi set of tools where uh, we try to transport arrow batches from the storage servers to the clients using uh, remote direct memory access so how this works is that uh, we the client goes and invokes a scan and uh, the scan basically uh, returns an iterator and the client then uses the iterator to go and uh, iterate over the result batches one by one and each iteration uh, receives column buffers using rdma directly from the server to the client uh, like fetches column buffers from the server to the client using uh, basically doing zero copy and that improves the performance uh, quite a lot. Also, uh, we store uh, the data, like we just store the raw data blocks uh, in, in SSDs and we use the persistent memory development kit tool to uh, access and manipulate the data on the SSDs. And uh, we store the file related metadata in a key value store called EOCAN. So we are basically using the Mochi set of tools to, uh, to be able to uh, provide zero copy, highly, highly performant uh, transport of data directly from the storage to the client while doing like computational storage. So this is like what I just discussed. Uh, we have a scan request. We go and uh, initiate a scan. The scan returns iterator, and we use the iterator to uh, get batches one by one, all uh, but doing RDMA under the hood. So this is the initial performance results that we uh, got from the Skyhook Mochi, Mochi effort. So we find we basically compare our results with the Arrow Flight framework, which is basically a gRPC-based framework and uses. Uh, TCP IP under the hood for data transport. Uh, so we did an experiment where we select 1%, 10%, and 100% of the rows that are in our data set. And we find out that, uh, for example, in the last two set of bars, uh, TL means thallium. So we see that using thallium or basically using RDMA uh, actually improves performance uh, quite, quite a bit. Uh, the, since it's reading from storage, so the query latency is actually dominated by the uh, disk IO latency, but otherwise uh, the RDMA based transport is super efficient. And you can see in flight, which does TCP IP, a lot of copying uh, goes on when you need to like copy, uh, copy the entire big uh, file to the network. And so uh, the copying over it is a lot and that affects performance quite a lot. Uh, yeah, so th that's uh, just on the Skyhook side now. Sorry, yeah, that's just on the Skyhook side. So now uh, uh, another parallel effort that we are doing is trying to uh, trying to uh, see how we can use Skyhook, like that basically the applications of Skyhook and like how to integrate it in the bigger picture. So uh, we have like designed ecosystem uh, where. We, where we have uh, basically a zero copy format, which is Apache Arrow. We have a distributed active storage layer, which is Skyhook. Now we are uh, exploring options for a distributed compute layer, which can do like uh, high level compute operations like group wise joins uh, using in a distributed cluster using technologies like uh, UCX MPI. And we are also looking over how we can support transactions in Skyhook using uh, our recent, our, our recent technology called lake housing or a table format. And we are also looking at how we can uh, basically finish this off with a expressive query interface where different query languages can generate standard query plans uh, that can be accepted by like popular data processing systems. So this is a high level uh, design that we are trying to uh, do. This is a slide taken from Ian Cook's uh, data thread conference presentation. So uh, basically on the storage layer, there are three layers, client and the compute engine and the storage layer. 
on the storage layer we have files uh, which is basically the data set and we and it is in the iceberg table format so this format of files supports transactions using a write ahead log uh, in the engine side we have compute engines such as uh, facebook's uh, or meta's velox engine or dask or cylon uh, and on the on the client side we have apache calcite or ibis which uh, basically takes a query generates a query plan and converts it into a common uh, query plan format which is substrate so basically the user provides a query it is it, it is converted into a substrate plan which is a basically a common way of communicating query plans between different systems and that's uh, the substrate plan is sent to a compute engine where it is chopped off into two parts one part to offload one part not to offload and uh, after the computation is done in both the layers we get back apache arrow tables back uh, yeah and thank you that's it for my presentation today thank you for listening Thank you. And before you know, I go to questions, um, I want to clarify that we don't have the whole picture yet. You know, uh, I want to make sure that people don't think that we have this this all implemented. And also, when we say we we did all this, um, we actually have a particular use case in mind, uh, which is high energy physics data. Um, and and mm -hmm. uh, and there are some. Uh, you know, particulars with high energy physics data it has a lot of embedded data in its tables. Um, and then, you know, we run into limitations of joins, for instance, uh, over embedded data. Um, but we have actually have started having a really nice collaboration with Cylon uh, that have very quickly reacted because they also happen to be very interested in in, in high energy physics data and a um uh, and 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 we're able to make that work for us uh, for joints, so distributed joints. Um, and we're now trying to convince them to use um, to become a um, a substrate consumer. Um, uh, so, any questions? Thank you so much, Jaji. Thank you. And Ian, thank you for, for, <laughs> for that slide. We never asked for permission, but I hope you don't mind because it's such a great uh, way of, of, of showing this overview of... Uh, um... I should send you a copy without my face in it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, get your watermark out there everywhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so um yeah if we we you know we try to put this together pretty quickly um but yeah so uh, you know any more questions directly to this talk uh before we go on to the next speaker to the next panelist i have a question uh did you, um yeah, when you correct. talk about the uh the mochi um uh, to work with the rdma protocol and yeah. And under what consideration, just want to know why you choose to return the data uh, independently if there's multiple uh, buffers instead of convert the result together into a single one and return that all together. Yeah, so if we try to basically return a single buffer uh, for the entire, uh, like not a single buffer list so uh, let me rephrase it so if we try to return the result as a just a single buffer uh, then what 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 i found is that what we actually need to do is copy all the column buffers one mm -hmm. by one into a contiguous format and then send that entire contiguous buffer at once back to the client which is uh, exactly what uh, arrow already does and uh which i found out to be inefficient uh i see so actually because... this is kind of the it is the when you talk about the overhead during the serialization is that the serialization process so i mean the serialization has a lot of things going into it different process and and when you talk about the serialization is that the memory allocation overhead during the serialization or is that any other functions causing the, the overhead during serialization? 
Yeah, it's the yeah, if you uh, if you if you talk about it, it, it is a memory allocation overhead. What if we can uh, say, for example, pre-allocate the memory to be used by the result data, so that we don't need to allocate it anymore. And so, for example, if you know the result data set is about this size uh, in this workload, and we can pre-allocate it. Uh, this memory space and use the same memory spaces for the further the, the further data set if it is if the total size fits inside. Yeah, so it's actually not the allocation over it exactly. So uh, uh, it's the so we did a perf uh, breakdown of the uh, latencies and we found out like at the top it was the mem copy calls. So so basically the thing is that when arrow generates a table all the columns are all scattered throughout the memory and it just holds pointers to the to those to those column buffers so you have to anyways do like you have to always do a, a mem copy to align to copy the buffers contiguous in a contiguous format to align them in a contiguous format basically so it's the copies actually not allocation according to me can you i'm just curious yeah can you so uh, for example, if when you do the serialization for each of the result or record batches, uh, can you pre-allocate the size, the memory size for the entire table and then chop, like for example, the first segment of this big memory and then sign that big memory for the serialization of the first uh, record batch. And so by doing that, when you doing when you finish the serialization for all the record batches, and they they are already inside a single contiguous memory buffer. You know what I mean. So uh, the point I start from is that I have multiple buffers scattered throughout yeah. in the memory. So uh, I mean, instead of instead of letting the 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 serialization function uh, allocate the memory itself, we pre-allocate the memory. But they are contiguous yeah. for, for all the uh, record batches. So the, the first record batches memory is uh, connected with the second uh, memory, the second yeah. part of the memory for the for the second record batches. Maybe we and can. Let, yeah, let me let me let me, let's let's just take that uh, or postpone that discussion a little bit because it's, it's getting to the, like the point where we where we're designing new stuff here, which is which is okay. great. Um, but I want to also give uh, 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 Aldrin and Tolly a chance to present their uh, their contributions. So, um, uh, because we're running a little short on time. <laughs> um, so, thank you so much, uh, uh, Jajit, and uh, great discussion. And uh, let's see, Aldrin, you're already sharing your slides. So, he's going to talk about his uh, awesome collaboration with Seagate and uh, the uh, Chen Zuckerman Foundation on the Human Atlas project. Yeah, so I uh, kind of call this portion of my research uh, MSG Express management of single cell gene expression data. And, uh, you know, there's a bunch of collaborators and, uh, you know, people I've been working with here. So I primarily work with Peter Alvaro, who's like my main advisor. Uh, in blue are the biologists we work with, and Josh Stewart is, uh, you know, head of, you know, that's his lab. Uh, and the other two are his students, uh, Bianca and Hongshu. Or actually, Hongshu uh, is now a professor, so that's cool. Um, Philip Kufelt is who I work with uh, at Seagate, so he's in green. And then Jeff and Carlos, who's also CS, um, are other people that like a lot of my ideas, uh, you know, we've talked about them that I'll bring up here. Uh, so uh, kind of at the top of our stack, is kind of the application domain, right? And so what I'm trying to do is uh, support use cases in single cell uh, sequencing analysis. And so this slide here just kind of shows like, uh, you know, in 2020, one of the main efforts uh, that was mostly completed or already completed uh, is a mouse atlas. And uh, here, like you'll see atlas a couple of times and actually there's various atlas efforts and. And then Atlas basically is trying to, you know, kind of like a world map, right? Map out 
all the cells in an organism? And then also what are all the states that those cells might uh, go through it in that cell's life cycle, right? So mouse atlas is like a million cells. Uh, that's like the uh, magnitude of that data set. Uh, human atlas, human cell atlas uh, in 2021 is like mostly, I guess, maybe like a stabilized, like it, it still has more to grow. But at that point it was, uh, all these say a million cells, but I don't think that's actually true. I think there's a typo here. Um, but it was larger than the mouse atlas. And then uh, where we're going is one lab 2022. So uh, this is some company that allows you to do single cell sequencing for a sample, right? So we'll have like a single cell sequencing, like a huge data set per person that gets sequenced um, and that sort of thing. And uh, kind of separately, kind of relevant to the bottom of our stack, uh, you know, there's this trend, right, of going from uh, single node or single processor pro uh, programming to cloud. Um, and like really where we're at now is like heterogeneous hardware uh, accelerators dispersed through, you know, your hardware architecture, right? And so what we want to do is kind of like look at these two things uh, and see if we can bridge the gap uh, there. <clears throat> so I'll kind of illustrate this. And so here, if we imagine uh, on the left, some application data, you know, the user uh, might partition that data and then that data uh, or each partition goes to some storage node in the database server, right? And like where these things might happen, you know, ideally most of it's handled by the database, but then depending on, you know, your technology stack, some of that uh, work might have to be done higher up, right? By the application developer, or even if they don't have to do it, maybe they have to know certain things in order to really get performance out of their system, right? And so kind of where we're kind of going, right, is that what if these storage uh, devices backing the database server or database nodes uh, have attached processors, uh, systems on chips, SOCs, um, and then how do we distribute queries in a way that like we're able to leverage what the hardware can provide we're also able to do it efficiently overall, but then we're also able to do it kind of as transparently as possible for application developers so that they don't have to learn like these new paradigms or, you know, really figure out new ways to squeeze out performance, right? Um, and how we're doing this is like, you know, I put here like some of the open source projects that we're leveraging um, or communities that are like tackling some of these things, right? So on the left for the you know application domain, there's SCverse and they're doing single cell like tooling, right? And then on the right, there's Skyhook, which brings relational data management or data access to Ceph. And then uh, Seagate has these computational storage drives uh, that they call Kinetic. And um, there they have like an open source protocol that uses protobufs. So like that's how you might communicate to those drives. Uh, and then we kind of sprinkle Apache Arrow across this whole thing. Um, and like I said, like there's a gap we want to fill and this gap is really like, how do we let uh, application developers stay as close to their domain as possible, but then allow us to do, you know, optimization or query planning or, you know, data management in a way that leverages this complex hardware uh, architecture underneath, right? And, uh, you know, when I'm dealing with, or when you're dealing with queries, right? Like you have to send them somehow. And so over the summer, like I started looking more into substrate, right? So, so all of these things are very connected for me or for this project. So kind of, I'll talk a little bit about like where I am and then mostly try to talk about like what's on the roadmap for the next uh, roughly eight months, right? So this is kind of the current software architecture. Um, and so uh, Bianca, who is a biology student that I'm mostly working with, like she's uh, developing an R, right? And so this uh, SC Beacon is kind of like their library, or it is their library. Um, and then this EBI preprocessing is kind of like, how do I bridge like their library to, um, you know, kind of my code, like start to provide an interface for like the actual data storage that's not just files. Um, so Python, uh, I'm using to kind of really uh, 
you know, I know Python much better than R. So like, that's kind of where I can do some uh, high level query planning or optimization or just like data, you know, ETL type of things, right? So I bridge R and Python <coughs> using Reticulate. Um, and then fortunately, Apache Arrow has bindings for both R and Python. And so in this way, I'm able to uh, leverage Arrow, but also share this data between these languages uh, with minimal overhead. And then um, I wrap C++ code with the Python, or I use Python to wrap C++ code. Um, and so a lot of what I'm doing, at least lower, like more in the storage system level, right? I'm really trying to take the skyhook approach, but extend it for computational storage devices, right? And so, uh, and then libkinetic here is kind of how, or the library that's used to talk to these kinetic drives, right? And so the libkinetic here in this client box uh, might talk to uh, the kinetic drive. And then if we want to execute a program that we put on this drive, you know, it kind of has a very similar layout where you're loading some program that's uh, using libkinetic uh, into memory, and then you're executing it against, against that drive. And what this kind of looks like a little bit more like the hardware architecture, right, is we have a query that um, is either going to a Skyhook client or constructed by the client. Uh, at the moment, we don't have this storage service, but the storage service represents either a Ceph OSD or something that's doing data placement, you know, something that can manage multiple drives, essentially. Um, and then our query is going to uh, the kinetic drive, and either it's a kinetic operation, which is kind of just get, uh, and like maybe you get like these specific key values, which like expression.0 or expression.1, or maybe you're running a function that's actually iterating over these key values. Uh, you know, and so this expression.0, expression.1, I call these like physical partitions because those are the actual data that's stored, but maybe a logical partition might just be, this is expression for some data set. Um, uh, and if anyone has questions or wants me to slow down, feel free to say so. Um, and so some results we've gotten so far is kind of more like when we're running these things or how we imagine them to run, what's the actual relative slowdown between, you know, a consumer processor or Intel processor and the processors on the kinetic drives, right, which are ARM SOCs. Um, and so the high level takeaway here is that there is a slowdown that's about 13x to 15x, um, which is about 4x more than kind of expected, right? So uh, the processors on the drives are, you know, designed to be like a lower frequency, you know, a little bit uh, weaker because they're cheaper, right? But we would expect like a four to five X slowdown, but this 13 to 15 X slowdown is what we're seeing. Uh, the 15 X slowdown is for like selections and projections. So it's a very high level, you know, going through the Apache Arrow uh, API. Um, and then the 13 X slowdown on the left is kind of more like, if we run a compute function in Apache Arrow against like a slice and a slice being like, you know, that key value, um, you know, what's that performance for end to end if we're like applying to each slice. Um, and I think a, another takeaway here is like, even given that that relative slowdown exists between the processors, uh, actually, if we do bigger slices uh, or essentially accumulate more key values in memory and then apply the function once on many of those, then we can amortize like some of this slowdown. Um, but it's more like, you know, amortizing something that compounds on top of this 13x slowdown, right? So, so that's a thing that we've seen. Um, <clears throat> right. And so what I want to kind of lay out here is kind of like what's the goal of our architecture or like where, where do we want to be, right? And so what I have here is in these top blue boxes, those are kind of the open source libraries that we want to uh, kind of work with, right? So SC versus Python, DIN versus R. Um, they do very similar things, but just in those two different languages. Uh, SC Beacon, as I've said, is in R. And then we kind of need some library that says, like, this is the application domain. How do we either, uh, you know, accommodate the way that these scientists want to express their data manipulations, right? Um, it's not necessarily that they're trying to use tables, like they are thinking more in matrices, right? So how do we do that mapping at a high enough level that like the lower level of our stack doesn't have to worry about it? Um, and or how do we do optimizations 
at a high enough level that like, you know, we are not like it can be cooperative with the rest of the stack, right? And then so sky tether is kind of like an extension of skyhook. Um, so skyhook kind of handles the design for how do we, uh, you know, do the relational data access against OSDs. Uh, but then sky tether kind of says like, well, we know that there's going to be another uh, level of indirection because um, these connect, uh, computational storage drives can do compute. So how do we go through Skyhook in a way that uh, we can still provide the most flexibility to the kinetic drives, right? Um, and so some of this communication to the storage servers and then also to the kinetic drives are going to be where we're, we're using substrate. Um, and so in this way, we'll also need to like do some sort of uh, optimization and or transformations on substrate query plans, right? So yeah, and then, <clears throat> so here I also kind of say like, at the bottom this is kind of like computational storage. This is the domain specific portion. And this is like a data management portion. And I highlight these because, so kind of the roadmap I'm trying to lay out for myself, right, is, uh, you know, at the computational storage layer, we've at least got designs and we have some initial results. So for now they're, you know, quote unquote done, but we'll probably revisit. Um, but then in the middle, like we kind of really need to figure out like uh, data placement over many drives, which is the sky hook and kinetic portion. Um, and also like, how do we form these substrate plans and uh, transform them? Um, fortunately in Python and R, there are like the arrow libraries or the, the bindings for the arrow library do construct like a Cero plans. So, you know, we could either leverage some of that or we can kind of go directly to the substrate. Um, but then at the end, like we need to prototype some of the things for the application domain and then like benchmark, you know, there's a lot of design space and configurations and, and tuning to be done. So this is kind of where I imagine we'll be going and, and how long I think things will take. Um, and then I just wanted to mention like, here's some of the open source projects or communities uh, that are relevant. Um, and that's pretty much all I had. Thank you, Aldrin. Um, I have a very quick question. So go back to the slide 11. Uh, I think that's what I said. Yeah, so you have No, oh, the 11, yeah. Um, storage servers. So um, do you have like storage server, do you have something like Ceph in mind or is there some, some other things that you have in mind or you're not allowed to talk about it yet? <laughs> um, yeah, so ideally it would be, Ceph, like that's like long-term plan, but in the meanwhile, like if I'm prioritizing query plan transformations and stuff, then, uh, you know, maybe it'd just be a facade uh, in the meantime, right? So it's kind of like, it could just be a flight service. I also imagine, you know, if we're using Ceph, they're all gonna be OSDs, but until, unless we're using Ceph, it could be mixed storage servers, right? It just kind of depends. Mm -hmm. So that's why I tried to be very general about it. Got it. And then that has implication of how you connect to them from the Skyhook DM client, I guess, right? For Sky yeah. Yeah. Okay, other? so that's a so the, yeah, man, that was my question as well. So if it was Ceph, you would still have the kinetic drives doing the co compute. Is that correct? Yes. So that's where I think there's like at a high level, it doesn't sound too different, but like in the details, like we would need to, so if Kinetic's doing uh, compute, then it's probably writing things to the drive that Ceph isn't gonna know about because it's not going through Ceph data paths. Um, but at the same time, like the main data that the users wrote uh, will be known about and the names of those things will be known about. So Kinetic needs to have something that can kind of cooperate in that way, but then also, you know, I, I think in the in the most extreme sense, like Ceph could just provide essentially data placement, right? It knows for some object where is it stored or where are the parts of it stored. Um, but on the other hand, you know, Ceph can also do some extra processing, right? So like we can extend Skyhook's uh, CLS definition so that like it kind of 
knows something about what it thinks kinetic will do or whatever backend computational backend might be back there. Well, I'll also point out that, I mean, if it is Ceph, then you actually have three tiers where arrow expressions can be evaluated, right? So, I mean, you should crawl before you run, right? But you've got this plan or you've got this space of plans that your optimizer could generate with decisions about where to place this pipeline uh, using both the OSD's host CPU and the kinetic CPUs, right? Yeah. So that's a that's a big planning space, but it's exciting. Mm -hmm. I will. No, yeah, I I agree, and so it's uh, it's fascinating where we could just put uh, offload, you know, up at the uh, at different layers of of of, this, of the Ceph architecture, um, mm -hmm. and also the idea always is, I mean, as a general rule if it can be done at the drive, but if the drives are not kinetic drives, it should, the same thing should work if with, with regular Skyhook and Ceph Absolutely. Um, yep. as well. So, um, so anything that you have in SkyTether, um, if, if it can be done with, um, and that just makes it much more flexible for, for, for customers. And so, mm -hmm. great. Thank you, Alvin. Yeah. And yeah, no, this is great. Thank you, Aldrin. And, and I, I just wanted to add really quickly, right. I, I was a little confused by that one mark remark you made. You know that that Seth wouldn't know about some data, but some other data would know, right? So, I think you can probably um, uh, manage your naming of the data in such a way that the name is always known, uh, but basically the result of 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 the name depends on whether the 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 content has been processed or not. And that's, I think, where the metadata of a substrate plan would be extremely helpful, right? Because it it could tell you what has been already processed and what hasn't. And um, and so you could actually use the same name in, various, in, in the various stages of the pipeline. Um, but then the substrate plan would actually tell you, uh, this has been already done, this is still left to do, sort of a to-do list mm -hmm. <laughs> that comes with yeah. a, it's like a workflow, right? That that uh, where where everyone the workflow is documented everywhere. It's sort of self-documenting. Uh, yeah, the mm -hmm. complexity is that a uh, computational drive, if you don't want to add overhead, probably doesn't want to go through Ceph's control flow. So Rados isn't going to know, or the object map's not going to necessarily know if the drive is caching intermediate results or something on itself. Right, the drive has to know, hey, I'm naming some key values in a way that like, maybe I can drop them later on, but like, you know, it, it it's just that like the drive could do things locally. And yeah, it's, a, it's an artifact of the platform, Carlos, that like, if you want to run a function on some date on a key value, it has to produce a new obscurely named key value. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You can have definitely local information. I, yeah. I, I'm not saying that. Oh, so that's what you meant that Seth doesn't yeah. know about. That's I, what he meant. Yeah. 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 Local information, fine, right? I I thought you meant uh, data that the client stored is somehow is independently of Seth, and you would bypass Seth. Uh, in a way that sounded weird. Um, yeah. so sorry, that was a misunderstanding. All right, let's move to Holly. Holly. Um, you have, uh, unfortunately, we also, we're running late, but uh, hopefully people will have some time to stay a little longer. Um, Ali, go ahead. Hi, um, uh, so uh, today I will be talking about uh, uh, my research, um, which is the age-sensitive um, physical design management for data lake house architecture. Um, so, um, so, uh, so at the beginning, I will talk a little bit about this. Um, so those are um, um, the data platforms. Uh, as we know that, um, you know, the in the last 20 years, the uh, IoT and social media has, uh, you know, created um, exponential growth of data. And um, the traditional data warehouse is uh, found incap incapable of um, 
handling um, it, it, because most of the data that's created is uh, unstructured. And so, um, and then the data warehouse um, requires a fixed data schema and a, a set of the advanced query pattern to be known before the data is even actually loaded into the data warehouse. And as we can see, it's the structured data loading into a data warehouse. So um, while it has, um, you know, really wonderful um, power at providing business intelligence and, you know, reports, um, there is the um, semi-structured uh, data and unstructured data that's generated by uh, machines of all kinds that are um, the data warehouses um, weak at uh, providing services to those to the data. On the other hand, uh, the data lakes that are uh, invented along with uh, the rise of big data, and they actually provide excellent write throughput. Um, so, and then the uh, data lakes are very uh, tolerant of any uh, format of data. So, um, so structured, unstructured, and uh, half partially structured, they can all be written um, and dumped into data lakes. Um, however, for the data that's uh, lack of structure, their um, data lakes do not provide very good uh, query capability before this uh, data actually gets processed into some structures. So with that and the, um, uh, um, the new generation of data platforms is the data lake house in, uh, in, uh, where um, a typical architecture has um, an analytic infrastructure built on top of data, uh, a data lake. And so, so then um, the data lake house can actually uh, also, because it has a data lake, component in it, and then they can also um, take in um, data with and without structures. And uh, after it gets processed by uh, the, the, infrastructure, the analytics infrastructure, it could provide a service to um, not only business intelligence and you know, the, the traditional BI, but also to like machine learning workloads and uh, data science. Um, the, the, however, the existing um, data lake house architectures, as we see in this uh, picture, that um, data still um, has to uh, you know, go through the analytics infrastructure uh, in order to be um, providing uh, insights. Um, so that which creates some uh, delay. And also uh, data has to be copied and transported from one part of the system to the other. And so they, it, it, they're stored at multiple places and that has a potential uh, inconsistency, data consistency um, issue. And also um, because there are different parts of the, uh, um, in the system, it, the, the, there are most likely um, quite complex, uh, complicated. So, so we are thinking if we could actually um, also have the, um, um, you know, build a uh, data lake house architecture, but inside it's, it's a one system. It's um, that could avoid those problems that a, the, the most common existing uh, data lake house architectures uh, have, um, then we could um, not only have high write throughput, but also provide uh, low latency um, for reads. And we don't have to uh, suffer the stunting complexity and um, all the, also data delays and um, the, data inconsistencies. Um, some, some background for uh, the, the system um, 
is named um, Abdullah, and it's this uh, age sens um, sensitive um, uh, physical design uh, management for uh, data lake house architecture. So uh, some background for Atla. Um, in the recent paper, Saxena actually uh, proposed using an LSM tree for um, transforming uh, row-oriented data into column-oriented oriented data. So as we see in this picture, when data gets uh, uh, come into a system, uh, when they gets it, the load zero is uh, re represents the memory of a uh, of a physical node. Um, below that, then the level one to three are the disk levels. So data actually flow from memory to um, disk levels when one level gets filled and each level has um, a higher capacity. And um, so since this, um, the LSM tree um, structure actually has this um, nature of compacting data, when the data is coming in, it only gets appended. And when it flows uh, from memory to disk structure, it actually uh, gets compacted for removing all the duplicate items and um, gets sort merged into a lower level, um, a, 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 you know, a, a disk, another uh, disk level. Um, so it, there is this, this transformation, since data is written from one level to another, um, then as you know, someone is uh, as the uh, the LSM tree is writing the data. Um, the the layout of data could, you know, could get transformed so that um, um, you know data is more laid out in a format that's uh, opt more optimal for reads. Um, so the, the sex nest papers, uh, the idea is for a. Um, the, it, it, just like LSM tree is mostly for a uh, single node um, case where um, you know there's memory component and there's a disk component. Um, we, we actually this, but this gives us an inspiration where we think that um, so in spite inspired by Sexnas paper, we we're thinking that we can actually um, map our uh, a um an, a distributed L LSM tree in the um more than one node. So um so in there this is an uh, LSM tree that's uh used in um in our uh experiment where um we actually have um so in node zero we have um data that's actually par uh, sharded, partitioned. And then as it falls down in, into uh, disk levels, um, it could be mapped into you know, like the node one, node two are only be, you know, it's like using the um, the the disk part of the nodes and then the node zero could be using the, the memory and the um, disk part of the nodes. So, um, so this is a uh, architecture of the system where um, this is a you know it, we actually um, uh, choose to map um, the Atna in a um, distributed self cluster, and, and um, so in, the, uh, in this case, there's uh, four levels, and the first level is um, the in memory level, and then the other three levels are disk levels. Um, as we see that I use different colors to show that um, it, it is a sharded uh, uh, compaction um, paradigm. So each color indicates that they could be mapped onto uh, uh, different nodes. And um, so each, as they go down the levels and they, um, the, the form, the physical design of the data actually gets transformed in our experiment that gets transformed from 
a row oriented data into more and more uh, column oriented data until uh, when they reaches the leaf level, it becomes its most column oriented format. Um, so when it goes down, um, it um, the the compaction and the data uh, physical design transformation are bounded together, and then the compaction that we use in our experiment is a uh, sharded compaction. So uh, so the key ranges are sharded so that you know, one from one parent node going down to uh, the children nodes in the LSM tree, it's necessarily uh, the, the data that's, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in that key range. Um, and then also um, for our system, the clients are, um, uh, the interface for clients with um, the, our system is, um, the clients are only contacting the um, um, LSM tree at uh, the, ro uh, the root node. And inside, um, it's all through this remote reads and remote writes and then uh, story, the request forwarding methods from one storage node to another. Um, so, the, so in order to use this uh, remote request forwarding method, we actually have uh, to name our object in certain schemes so that the object, um, the storage objects know to, to which ones to forward the uh, request. Um, the, we actually borrow the uh, file system uh, convention by specifying the level and the key range. Um, of a uh, object, not only at the end. So, in the in the internal path is always the level and the key range, and then going down to next level and the key range. But the last one, it will have within the level and the key range. Then it will have the column group um, that, um, and it, it, for every uh, storage object, it actually has um, a bloom filter and this um, um, column group transformation map inside it. So it, with this, it could, we do not need any metadata node and then it can always find uh, to which uh, objects to forward the request. Um, the remote write um, um, method on the left, um, is that when a op, uh, storage object gets a write request from the client, it actually, if you see that this, uh, if it's full, if this object is full and it, it triggers the compaction, and then it will actually write the data that it has into, um, based on the key range mapping, like the this, uh, partition. It will actually forward the data in through this scatter method to uh, other objects. And then the, also this request uh, remote read is uh, recursive. So if in case uh, another object that gets it also finds that it needs compaction, um, it will actually forward the request uh, further on. Um, the read requests working similarly, but in a, a different direction. So when a re uh, object gets a read request, if it finds that it does not have that data, it will actually go down a level to continue search. Um, but it will actually send this forwarded request to um, all its children nodes that are in the same key range. Um, I mean, in the in the range that this the the value or the values that are being searched are in, and you will forward this to those uh, nodes, and you know through this gather method, and it's also recursive. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about about this sharded compaction. So, um, the typical LSM tree has a uh, tiering and leveling compaction. And the ranging compaction, it, the uh, tiering compaction is uh, when a level need, is filled, it actually all the um, runs 
actually are because they are not sorted um, uh, between those rounds. So then they will get uh, sorted and merge into a next round, next a round in the next level. That's a tier compaction. And for leveling, it's uh, because every uh, level actually has one run. And so every time when one uh, level needs is filled up, it actually will um, uh, like level I, it will um, get merged into level I plus one. So it's level I is filled up and then it will uh, sort merge with the existing data in level I plus one and then get merged into a new level I, it will rewrite into a new run. Or in our uh, um, paradigm, um, so the run in level I, whenever it's um, it's filled, it actually, it, it acts kind of like a leveling. It gets merged with the existing data in level I plus one and then in the right, rewrite into a new uh, run, but because it's sharded, so every level it's sharded in that, it, you know, so then there are, Gonna, there's going to be multiple runs on every level. So for that, it actually resembles tiering. So it re resembles both um, uh, tiering and, and leveling. And uh, the sharded compaction is uh, um, actually nice because um, it does not, uh, a, a level is not waiting until it's completely filled in order to uh, trigger compaction. And instead, whenever a partition is filled, a compaction will start. So then in the in in the end, it actually triggers more, more frequent but smaller jobs for compaction and keeping the compaction demon process um, um, more busy instead of in a bursty uh, fashion, uh, in, instead of working in a bursty fashion. And um, also when it comes to read, uh, because this uh, each level, all the data is sharded by the key range, so the the search space gets reduced, and then it improves the read performance. Um, and then we talked about the physical design transformation that we're experimenting with, which is uh, as we go down from one level to another, we uh, split, it's it's actually split by key ranges as well as uh, we'll split um, column groups um, to uh, for the uh, data to get to most column oriented uh, on the leaf level. Um, here are some um, uh, preliminary evalu uh, result. I realized that as I was preparing this today, the slides, I realized that this, the, um, the the graphs are the the ones that I um it was they were a little old and then in the graph we call this system not uh, Aptona but Kramer so um but you know if uh if you know if we ignore that um and we can see that um for right throughput. Oh, we actually have two straw men on, in our evaluation. And straw man is um, straw man one is the one that we um, we do not do any um, uh, the, the physical design transformation. We also have a LSM tree. It's also uh, mapped in Ceph, but data will come in. Um, it's a row format, and then when you go down to like the four levels, it remains the uh, um, row format. The straw man too is that uh, as soon as we get the data, we actually partition them to, into like uh, column oriented. So it's only um, a single column uh, oriented from all the levels from memory until the fourth, uh, the, the, la the leaf level. Um, so as, uh, as uh, so we can see that um, the the right throughput uh, for um, it's for our system is actually the blue line here. Um, it's actually uh, similar to that of the uh, Strowman one and Strowman two, um, and then the 
the on the right hand side is the reads uh, latency. No one is uh, scanned. The other one is uh, for reading a single value. Um, as we see that uh, for reading a single value, it, uh, our system is uh, similar to um, uh, Strawman One. I think Strawman One. Maybe I said it backwards. I think Strawman One is actually the uh, uh, column oriented all the time. Um, and for scan, um, I think our system is um, actually do uh, perform better than um, and then Strowman one and Strowman two. So so we can um, um, see that um, you know with our experiment, um, even though it's uh, preliminary, it's actually uh, for reading and writing, uh, we are uh, achieving our hypothesis, which is that uh, it will uh, providing uh, it will provide the uh, uh, lower read latency. I mean, the comparable uh, read latency with a read optimal um, uh, platform, and it will uh, provide a similar write throughput with a write optimal uh, platform by doing this uh, uh, physical design transformation, um, hiding it inside the LSM trees compaction. Um, so the remaining challenges in future work, um, uh, we wanna see that, I mean, the, the physical design transformation is not only going from role oriented to uh, column oriented data, although I think that's, a very, very common and probably one of the most useful uh, uh, conversion uh, conversions. Uh, however, there are other ones. There's there could be um, you know like compression or um, uh, data format conversion from one format to another, like binary versus uh, text, um, and and others. So um, how do how can we support um, more physical design transformation um, and then uh, adapting to uh, query access pattern changes? Actually, the the name of the the age sensitive is that uh, our hypothesis says uh, is that as um, as data ages, um, so more um, analysis queries are gonna be querying. Um, uh, the older data, and then when it comes to that, and uh, are more interested in aggregating uh, values over columns, and so they actually favor column columnar storage. Um, whereas when data is really new, uh, they're just they just came in. Um, the queries that are gonna access those. Uh, data are generally more like transactional and they are interested in looking at every attributes of uh, that data point. So it's it's mostly going to uh, touch, you know, uh, the in that case, the role based is going to like great to perform better. Um, another thing about the remote write is that right now it's not atomic. So whenever uh, it, it actually forwards the requests to scatter. Um, it could result in a situation, some of them are successful and then some one are unsuccessful and that, that could cause this um, data to be uh, inconsistent. So um, I was thinking about uh, how do I support the uh, uh, atomicity of the remote write uh, by perhaps adding the sequence numbered updates so that then um, for any failed one, so we'll just retry and then the sequence number will help to determine if this thing uh, for any particular uh, objects uh, that uh, updates has already been um, carried out. Um, another thing is that for concurrent um, uh, read and write operations, um, Right now, using the read-write logs, and I was thinking 
if we could um, improve by having um, lock-free reads, uh, that which could uh, further improve uh, uh, read performance. Uh, another thing is that right now, like um, all the thing, the the data that's uh, that we are implementing with in Aptla is actually or just reading. Um, uh, it, it's implemented in the COS layer in stuff, but all the serialization and deserialization and all that is just um, uh, just something that uh, we developed. Um, so I was thinking, um, you know, like it would be actually nice if we could integrate with some of the Apache Arrow for uh, the storage format, so you don't have to, uh, so it gets standard and also will, um, um, you know, help us for uh, the, you know, serialization and deserialization and then transferring data. Um, between the OSDs. Um, I think that's yeah. it uh, for me. Yeah, Ali, we're, we're like way over time. Um, I think you you spoke for almost 25 minutes. So, um, so um, uh, unfortunately, I think we're, I mean, it's, there was really good work and I think it is, there's a lot of promise there. Um, but I also also want to make sure that you know everybody understands that those results are very preliminary. We still have a lot of questions about those results, um, and and um, I don't think we can actually you know draw any solid conclusions out of those results, right? But I think that um, uh, I want to sort of respect everyone's time because we're like almost half an hour over time, um, and. Um, uh, thank everyone for for joining this session. Um, I'm I'm really you know uh, pleased with you know everyone who's, who's who's listening and we have some coming so some conversations uh, going on also. Uh, so Ian Cook um, uh, is very interested in in finding out more about uh, our you know the kinds of things we're doing. Um, and um, I think we we would love to just sort of continue this discussion with Baltran Data. Uh, you know, um, Adrian was a summer student in Baltran Data, that, um, and so uh, really really looking forward to a, a very fruitful collaboration. I actually also put a question for Ian, sort of. I think summarizing a question that I have, sort of for, across all those projects that we. Uh, that we looked at, except uh, Ismail's project, um, maybe. Uh, but actually, I should also say Aldrin's project, um, Aldrin's and Holly's projects. Um, uh, and and uh, you can read it. But you know, I want to basically um, think we 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 used everyone's time enough, and uh, thank all the panelists very much for for contributing. And for everyone who's uh, who joined and listening to us, thank you so much.